Join me for a hymn sing at the 2024 Issues Etc. Making the Case Conference, Friday, July 12th, and Saturday, July 13th at Concordia University, Chicago. This year's theme, Hymns for the Battle. Learn more and register at issuesetc.org. The Word of the Lord Endures Forever is brought to you in part by the Lutheran Heritage Foundation. LHF is a recognized service organization of the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod dedicated to translating and publishing the books of our Lutheran faith into more than 100 languages for our Christian brothers and sisters around the world. Learn how you can take part in their work at lhfmissions.org. Welcome to The Word of the Lord Endures Forever with Pastor Will Whedon. Okay, I cannot even begin to count up how many times the apostles urge us toward what they call doing good. Anyone who thinks that Christians are not to be exhorted to be doing good and doing all manner of good works is thinking in an unapostolic manner. The Word of the Lord Endures Forever is a daily verse-by-verse Bible study with the church, past and present. Pastor Whedon is leading us in a study of the book of 1 Peter. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Greetings, people loved by God. In our last study, we heard Peter continue with the contrast between the honor that comes to those who believe versus the shame that comes to those who do not. The believers are like living stones built on the foundation of Christ himself and growing up into a temple in the Lord, a holy priesthood offering spiritual sacrifices. But the unbelievers... Well, to them, Jesus is a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, quoting Isaiah 8. They stumble, Peter says, because they disobey the word, that word that pointed them to Jesus for salvation. And he says they were destined to stumble because God is determined to save those and only those who believe in his son, who trust in him for salvation. He then switched back to reminding the believers what they've become through their baptism into Christ a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, who proclaim the praises or excellencies of the one who has called them out of darkness and into his marvelous light. Peter alluded to Hosea 1 and reminded them that once they were not a people, but now they truly are God's people, a people of received divine mercy, a mercy embracing Jew and Gentile in the cross of the Savior. So then, Peter urges them and us to abstain from the passions of the flesh that wage war against the soul, that is, the desires of the old Adam that war continually against the impulses of the Holy Spirit, even as the Holy Spirit's impulses war against the old Adam. Remember, no truce between these two. They are implacably opposed to each other. So, Peter urges that our conduct among the Gentiles, the unbelievers, be honorable. That means honoring of Christ so that when they slander us for our faith in Jesus, they may see the good deeds we do, and instead glorify God on the day of visitation. A reading from 1 Peter, the second chapter, beginning at the 13th verse. Be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor as supreme, or to governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil, and to praise those who do good. For this is the will of God, that by doing good, you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but living as servants of God. Honor everyone. Love the brotherhood. Fear God. Honor the emperor. 1 Peter 2, verses 13 to 17. Let us pray. Lord God, bless your word wherever it is proclaimed. Make it a word of power and peace to convert those not yet your own and to confirm those who have come to the saving faith. May your word pass from the ear to the heart, from the heart to the lip, and from the lip to the life, that, as you have promised, your word may achieve the purpose for which you send it. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Ready to ponder today's passage? Let's give it our undivided attention. Verse 13, be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution. The heritage of fallen humanity is that we all by nature live as if we 
we're God. We want to follow the dictates of our own appetites and desires, and we very much resent any sort of restraint placed upon us. I usually characterize the old Adam's constant refrain as, I want to do what I want to do when I want to do it, and if you get in my way, I'll make you sorry you did. The old Adam's refrain lives and rules inside of everyone, not reborn of the Spirit. It manifests itself in the little two-year-old stomping her foot and shouting out a defiant no to her mom. It manifests itself in the teen, disregarding the express command and will of his dad and mom and sneaking out of the house to do his own thing. It manifests itself in the sexually active adult, who feels free to use another person as an object for his own gratification without any commitment to love and care for them as a person, and then passes on to the next one. And yes, it shows itself in the way that when the cat is away, the mice will play. The way we obey authorities when we spot the cop car sitting in the median and slide the foot off the gas pedal so that we can slip past him or her as though we'd not just been breaking the law a few hundred feet back. Guilty. What about you? The old fellow inside of us is pure and simply a rebel, and he chafes against any and every suggestion of restraint. So, When a person comes to belong to Christ and has within him or her the Holy Spirit tugging in a different direction, the battle ensues. It's a battle to submit for the Lord's sake to every human institution. Didymus the Blind, commenting on this in the latter part of the 4th century, said, The proclaimers of the truth take all opportunity from wrongdoing away from us by describing how we should behave toward those who are in power in such a way that the gospel and its teaching will not be hindered by us through our unwillingness to do what they require of us and by telling us to be subject to them when it's clear that we are doing something in accordance with just laws, nor should we be worried if they do not act in the way appointed by God because he is in charge of them and he will judge them accordingly. Did you notice how old Didymus built into that Peter's exhortation from his words in Acts 5.29? But Peter and the apostles answered, we must obey God rather than men. There are limits to obedience. Peter continues, though. Verse 13 continued, whether it be to the emperor as supreme, 14, or to governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil and praise those who do good. So Peter is clearly thinking of governmental authorities here, And he's running exactly along the same line St. Paul took in Romans 13. For there is no authority except from God, Romans 13.1. The authorities thus serve us as God's own ministers or servants. While Paul speaks primarily of the negative power of the authority, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer, Peter adds that there is a positive role for government. It is to praise or commend those who do good. The Venerable Bede understood this well. He wrote from his own experience in 8th century England when he said, This, therefore, is the praise which good men receive when they act properly and obey the king's servants, even when it means putting up with the ignorance of unwise governors. Verse 15. For this is the will of God, that by doing good, you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Okay, I cannot even begin to count up how many times the apostles urge us toward what they call doing good. Anyone who thinks that Christians are not to be exhorted to be doing good and doing all manner of good works is thinking in an unapostolic manner. Neither Peter nor Paul nor James ever tire of reminding us of this. And here, Peter equates the doing of good with the will of God. God wants us to do good, and for this very important reason, to put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Remember how in the early days of the Christian church, Christians were accused of all sorts of nonsense? They were called atheists because they didn't worship idols or any of the gods of the ancient pantheons. They were thought to practice incest because folks heard that when we gathered as church, a kiss of love was exchanged between those assembled. They were thought to practice cannibalism 
because they heard that when we gathered, we partook of the body and blood of the Lord Jesus. Against all these hideous and distorted rumors and more, Peter urged the baptized to live lives of doing good in order to squash the calumnies of their foes, meaning, of course, those who hated the Christians, not those the Christians hated, for hatred is forbidden to the followers of the Lord of love. My friend Joe Hurl and I were talking about a book he was reading the other day, The Patient Ferment. Its author set out to study the mission strategies of the early church, only to find out, surprise, surprise, they didn't have any. Rather, they patiently endured suffering, constantly sought to do good, catechized those who sought to join them, and they grew by leaps and bounds. The patient ferment of the church's love and her humble submission to the authorities, trusting in King Jesus and his ultimate gracious rule, that was what silenced her foes. Verse 16, live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but living as servants of God. This is Peter's version of St. Paul's words in Galatians 5.13. For you are called to freedom, brothers. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. Liberty dare never become license or a cover-up and pretext for doing evil. That is, God loves to forgive and I love to sin, such a deal away with such demonic nonsense. Rather, we're set free to become servants. Martin Luther riffed on this in his seminal treatise on the freedom of the Christian, which he published in 1520 and even dedicated to none other than Pope Leo X. He put it like this, A Christian is a perfectly free Lord of all, subject to none. A Christian is a perfectly dutiful servant of all, subject to all. Those twin statements capture exactly the point Peter is making in verse 16. We have to live as people who have been set free, free from sin, free from death, free from the condemnation of the law. But as those who are thus free, it's our joy and delight to live as servants of God through Jesus Christ. Ecumenius turns back a couple of centuries to St. John Chrysostom's insight on this. He writes, This verse does not imply, according to John Chrysostom, that the apostle now wants us to be subject once again to earthly powers and obey them. No, we are to obey them as free people, honoring the one who has delivered us and who has told us to do this for his sake. Beautiful. And I love that a few years after Chrysostom, folks had already recognized the great wisdom God had given that man in his exposition of the Bible. Peter goes on, verse 17, Honor everyone, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the emperor. Honor everyone, for the king of heaven has assumed our common humanity into the unity of his Godhead. Even though they don't know it yet, every person we meet is actually a brother or sister to the king of all. We honor him when we treat them with honor and respect due to the members of the royal family. And we are to love the brotherhood, that is, love the church, which through baptism has made us all be the family of Jesus Christ, his sisters and brothers. All men are that in potential, but in the church, that potential has been realized in the baptismal water. Fear God. The Weimarische Bibelwerk, that great Lutheran study Bible from the 17th century prepared under the theological oversight of Johann Gerhardt, glosses that with, as the one who sees and hears everything that you do and say, obeying him rather than men. And then Peter wraps up with the command to honor the emperor again. In Peter's time, that would be Nero, the man who would order Peter's own death. Peter will go to that death without protest and in obedience. He knows who the true emperor is and to whom even the great Nero would one day have to give an account. And right there is where we'll call it quits for today. Next up, Peter moves from obedience to the government to obedience of servants to masters. We might call it today employees to employers. He urges this especially to those who are unjust and unkind. This is the mark of the Christian. To endure suffering graciously, mindful of God. There's no credit to being patient when you're being penalized for your own foolishness. But when you're suffering righteously, 
you're following in the footsteps of Christ, who left us an example, so that we might know also how to suffer injustice, all the while committing our cause to the one who in the end judges justly. Till next time then, people loved by God, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Thanks for listening to The Word of the Lord Endures Forever with Pastor Will Whedon. The Word of the Lord Endures Forever is a listener-supported program. You can donate by check. Make your check payable to The Word Endures and send it to Box 616, Collinsville, Illinois, 62234. You can also make a secure online contribution at thewordendures.org. The Word of the Lord Endures Forever is a production of LPR, Lutheran Public Radio.